republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the agenda? I move that we approve the agenda as presented. Thank you. Is there support? Support. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. We'll move on to uh, learning highlights and communication update, and I'm sure Mark has uh, more things for us this evening. Thank you, Jim. Um, I guess I'll start with the communications update. Uh, we, we were moving forward with all of our, you know, we're on track with all of our usual things. Um, the Orion Living Magazine, I assume everyone received it in the past week, so it hit all the mailboxes a little delayed, but that's, I guess, the normal, uh, you know, shipping process of everything these days, but hopefully everyone received it and enjoyed it. And uh, we're moving forward um, inside the Dragons. Uh, ben and I were just working today to finish up that edition, and hopefully it'll be out in the next uh, week or two by the end of the year. So that'll be that'll be great. And uh, most a lot of my time's been spent, you know, working on our messaging and the things that we've shared with the community over the last couple of weeks. Obviously, there's been a number of dynamics and working with cabinet to make sure those are you know, appropriately sharing with the community all of the information that we can. So uh, that's most of the communications. In terms of the learning highlights, uh, there's been, it's great to have our students in person and being in, in the buildings, and I think that they've really enjoying it and adjusted well. So uh, if you want to go to the next one, thank you. The middle school media specialists have been working for a couple months, and uh, they share this information, you know, with Heidi, and it's great to be able to bring it to all of you. Um, the middle school media specialist, Becky Lowe, you know, Kat Monti and <coughs> Melissa Kemsky, they, they run their whole buildings and they're always doing different things and they're trying to be innovative and creative. So they do, they've done book tastings this year. They presented at the, the Michigan Association of Media Specialists, the MAME, uh, that's their organization at the state level. They do 3D printing, they're doing Ozbots with coding, they're preparing for the battle of the books. It, you know, they have a lot of, they're juggling all the time. They have all different things with three different grades. And, you know, in middle school, kids really expand their opportunities and the things that they are interested in. And that's really an opportunity for them, you know, to be innovative and creative. And they all do a great job with that. So that's been really great over these couple of times. Uh, here's Chief Rossman, who is here. Um, he's out there, so you can say hi to him. Uh, you know, he, soon after uh, the Oxford tragedy he you know when our students came back he was at Blanche Sims as were deputies in you know from across yeah, the, there he is. <laughs> you know he, he deserves a he and uh, Lieutenant Darren O'Fara and uh, Lieutenant Stephen Dooley are the representatives we work with and they're all their deputies and officers you know and they been great to our buildings over these couple weeks and you know they're always great but it really they've shown such caring you know for our students and our staff and that's really been greatly appreciated so we wanted to recognize them the Troy field trips are always a challenge you know especially in the COVID and we're trying to work back towards them a little bit but it's a lot easier these days to have controlled you know opportunities for the students to push the outside groups to push into the classrooms. And the Troy Historical Society is a place where a lot of our schools have gone over the years, but in this situation, they were able to come into Blanche Sims a couple weeks ago, and Ben and I were there to see them. And what they did is a lot of, this was, it involved, he talked about the pioneers, but he also talked, showed them little toys, you know, that were made back then. And, you know, the concept that these are toys versus what these kids, you know, actually consider toys really had them riveted. They were, they were curious about all the different things. Um, ben saw it and he saw all the different interactions and stuff, right? Yeah, at the bottom right, didn't he uh, teach the kids how they practice to milk cows? Yeah, right. Was, uh... <laughs> right, right. It was, it was definitely, their eyes were open to uh, things that they had not learned about. So that, that was exciting. <laughs> Um, Matilda Jr., the musical, you know, Christina Welling always puts on a great show every year at Walden, and, and she works really hard at it. And this year, obviously, is a challenge, and she's trying to do it differently. Last year, when she did her show, it was all recorded, and then it was posted. This year, it was live action, and she wasn't sure. She wanted to make sure there was a lot of promotion. Well, they sold out the first night much quicker than they thought. And, you know, they made great progress on the second night as well. And so I think it was really, and they were able to be creative. If you can see the clear masks, 
you know, that you can still see their lips when they're, they're singing and they're dancing and stuff. And, and that's, I think, a lot of the theater, they've done that at the high school, too, with Jonathan Kind's productions. And I think they've found ways to, you know, try to make things work. Um, and, you know, the, the picture up there, you see the, the tech people, too, don't always, they're not on the stage, but they do a lot. And the students at the middle school level with these productions do a lot, and the high school, of course, as well, do a lot of the tech work. So they, they're able to be a part of the shows as well, even though they're not on the stage. Um, went to the early childhood center one day when there was snow and the kids, we, you know, just seeing the interactions with that early childhood playground, which is, you know, one of the featured parts of, of that really was great because they, the students have learned over these couple months all the different ways to use it, which is what was intended, you know, when Heidi and her team were planning out this playground, you know, it was creative. I mean, you know, they had the opportunity, we've talked about this before, to just take a standard playground and put it in there, but instead they tried to make it nature and kind of have them embrace it. And the students are, you know, warming to it, which is really great, um, finding all the different ways to use it. This is at Pine Tree Center, Diana Schick's class, you know, connected with 101-year-old um, Wilma Aya, let's see if I can say this right, Wilma Aya Cafano, and she read them a book, and uh, they really were listening, and this was, this just happened this week, and it was a great it was what the EI classroom and the students were really engaged with her and doing this online. It was really an opportunity to have someone connect with them and talk about, and they wanted to get their her wisdom. And so one of the students said, I will take your wise wisdom. <laughs> and they really, uh, you know, appreciated her doing that. So also at Pine Tree Center uh, was the Lions Club holiday party. Rick was there, Ben was there, Birgit, Danielle were there. They saw all the opportunities. You know, this is, it was always a big holiday party that the Lions Club was able to do, and obviously in COVID that's not really feasible, but they still want to have a commitment. They still want to come to the students, and so what they would do, they brought little presents, you know, they interacted with the students, and the students' faces, as you can imagine, just lit up because, you know, the idea of Santa and Mrs. Claus and the elf being there and presenting them with this, you know, was really engaging and exciting for them. The Oakview You Before Me Club, this is just this last weekend. Um, they were at the Orient Center for the Breakfast with the Grinch, and they're just there to assist. And, you know, it's really a great club. They've done a lot of things just this fall in community events where they need, where their assistance is needed, just helping with younger kids or whatever. And uh, we've shared that in Learning Highlights before, but it's great. Christine Kutchins wanted, she always shares those with me so I can uh, bring that to you. So it's really nice. And this is just last week. The Elias Thespians were at the State Thespian Festival. Um, and obviously it's an opportunity to interact with different groups from around the state, but it's also an opportunity for them to benefit. We had five students who were offered essentially six, over $630,000 in scholarships for theater if they choose to accept those in college. Um, so it's, you know, their, their talent was recognized. 17 other students received recognition. And one of the students there uh, was Abby Meisel, who you may have seen in the Detroit Free Press, made that beautiful art of the dragon wrapping the wildcat. And um, so she's, you know, she deserves definitely recognition. It's great that she got that in the, um, you know, used her talents and was recognized, you know, across the state. She's heard from many places and many people, you know, with interest in that drawing. And um, our art teacher, Sam Rimmy, is assisting her, you know, with people who are reaching out. So it's great. Um, that we're able to support however we can. And uh, that's about it. Any questions? Questions for Mark. A lot of good information tonight. Thank you, Mark. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. And we'll move to uh, new certified staff candidate introduction. And uh, Rick, Yes, we, uh, we are bringing before you tonight a school psychologist, Leanne Bros. Leanne, if you want to stand up and say hello. Um, oh. I'm assuming that's your significant other with you. Yeah. Yes. All right. Um, actually, this is the second time I've been involved in the hiring of Leanne. I hired Leanne uh, when she first came out into uh, West Bloom or yeah, West Bloomfield. Uh, I won't say how many years ago because it's been a few. But yeah. So we welcome her to us from West Bloomfield, and uh, thanks. Welcome. 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 We're glad you're here. All right. And 
we'll, we'll be taking action on that uh, a little bit later. Um, we'll move on to high school leadership class, and I'm looking forward to yeah. that report. Yeah, we have two young ladies today. We have uh, Sydney Peters and uh, Melinda Brunk, who will give us our presentation. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, I'm Sydney, and I'm the Secretary of Leadership Development Workshop's Executive Board, and very happy to be back in school this week and to provide you with some updates as to what we've been up to for December. Hi, I'm Melinda. I'm the Vice President of Leadership Development Workshop, and like Sydney said, we're just happy to be back this week, and we're happy to give you this presentation. I know that I got pushed back from last <laughs> week, but we are happy to be here and share with you everything that's happened over these last few weeks. Um, our first slide is on awareness boards. Obviously, this is a reoccurring thing that we do. But these past awareness boards have looked particularly amazing. As you can see the, the slide on the right, the Can Drive did an amazing Alzheimer's Awareness Month um, board. And in the left-hand corner, you can see Sydney Peters' younger sister, Emma, <laughs> hanging up a Taylor Swift board about what's trending, because obviously she's trending as always. But yeah. All right, and then we also wanted to highlight our LDW Oakland Activities Association representatives, which is Farrah Kosal, Savannah Chappie, and Dorian Hill. And in November, they attended their monthly OAA meeting and they participated in a fun service project of making blankets. Um, our first LO Lotto went on over those last couple weeks. And um, it was Flannel Friday, as you can see in these pictures. These are pictures of our lead niners and their flannels. We had a great turnout. It's something that we do every Friday. This upcoming Friday, we're doing reverse LO Lotto, where we're having the kids donate money to um, the Oxford Leadership Department, and we are all going to wear blue and gold in support. Great. All right, and then speaking of kind of building our group closer together, we have committed <coughs> to sort of engaging in more team building activities with our leadership class. And we want to promote that these activities are mostly focused on building everyone's leadership skills. We have a huge amount of sophomores in our class this quarter, which is both a blessing and a bit of a hindrance since they are completely new to the program. But we want to build them up and help them learn how to be good leaders and work well as a team. So here we had Thanksgiving dishes created out of Play-Doh through randomly assigned groups. And we had our winning dish was, I don't believe pictured, but they made a turkey leg and then a strawberry pie out of Play-Doh. It looked amazing. Right. <laughs> um, another thing that's been going on lately is the Can Drive and the Giving Tree. Both of these events end this Friday. But for the can drive, we have gotten about 4,000 cans. We're moving ahead with that. Um, you can see a social media post that all the um, members posted in order to support and um, advertise this event. And it has run from November 29th and will end, like I said, on Friday. Obviously, with being online last week, it kind of hindered our expectations, but we had quite a turnout. We had kids show up every single day in order to help collect cans and that is going wetter than we thought. Also with Giving Tree, um, again, last week kind of hindered that, but we still are moving ahead. We have gotten a lot of gifts. We've had those things put into boxes and they are ready to be shipped to those families and we're just help, happy to help families that are in need. And of course, all the ornaments that um, do not get taken, leadership will buy most of them so that those families do get a good Christmas this year. All right, and then speaking of events we have going on right now, we just put on a new event this Wednesday morning, which is our LOHS staff breakfast. We're very excited for the Staff Appreciation Committee, which is a new committee this quarter, to really work hard on showing appreciation to our wonderful faculty at LOHS. And the highlights included <coughs> Leo's Coney Island Catering, Christmas Carols sung by the LOHS Chamber Choir, holiday themed games, and Dunkin' Donuts and Starbucks coffee donated by the Scripps Middle School PTO. We Very are nice. so, so thankful to have been able to carry out this event without a hitch and grateful to everybody who was a part of putting it together. <laughs> um, upcoming events that you should keep on your radar is obviously today was our staff breakfast. On Friday, January 7th, we're going to hold our middle school leadership conference and we're moving ahead with that. Um, also on that Friday, we're doing the blood drive. The email for that went out today and we are getting responses that in, for kids that are interested in donating blood. Um, on Sunday, January 9th, the Boys Not Out Committee will put on their event and a bunch of elementary school boys will be participating in that. And a new event for us um, on Monday, January 17th, but it actually just got moved to um, 
the 20th is something called <laughs> Open Mic Night. I got changed like yesterday, don't worry. Um, <laughs> open Mic Night and our uh, Open Mic Night Committee will be hosting 21 Front Street, and we're going to be having kids sign up to perform. And it's just going to be like a little get-together for that week of exams. It's going to be super fun. We're going to have a bunch of performers, and they're going to have, like, um, there's a sign-up genius for kids that can sign up to do whatever they participate in, whether that's stand-up comedy, whether that's singing, whether that's dancing, you know, whatever you, they want. It's going to be a two-hour event. It's going to be free. We're going to try to get as many people as we can to show up to that, and we're super excited. All right, and then our last and final slide is Keep On Your Radar, Salt for Soldiers is coming soon, and then we both have our sellout hoodies, which were distributed to the entire leadership class, second quarter and beyond, and we just want to spread awareness to bring this event back in 2022. With that being said, do you all have any questions for us? Do we know what the date is for that yet? We are still in the works of figuring out the final details, but we'll be more prepared to present on that at the next meeting. That's a great answer. Also, <laughs> also you guys um, are going to go a long way. In life. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing is that if you once you guys are all done here tonight, there is a Buffalo Wild Wings fundraiser going on as we speak. So you can head over there to get some food on your way home, and you can show them um, this little slip. We can post. I think it's posted on the leadership. Instagram. Um, if you show them the little tag, then the other proceeds will go to our sellout fundraiser. So just a little right. tidbit. Thank you very much for having us. Thanks Thank for all the good news. We'll look forward to your report in January. All right. So from there, that good news, we'll move on to uh, our presentation tonight regarding enrollment. And uh, Rick will be sharing some information with us. You cursing now me. It's back on. I'm just gonna walk away. <laughs> well, good evening. Um, it's that time of year where I know this really excites many of you. <laughs> Jake. <laughs> <laughs> numbers, right, Jake? Um, we're gonna run through some enrollment for those new board members. Uh, this is the time of year where I kind of set the stage. Typically, what I've done in the past is really focus on um, some historical data and some um, of projections for uh, years to come. Um, I've decided to add one more to that this year, and it's gonna be a two-part presentation. We're gonna talk about current status. I know with us uh, implementing um, our virtual program, schools of choice and so forth, I wanna run through all that. I'm gonna try to get through this one quickly. I'm not gonna hit every slide in full detail, but the information's there for you to kind of dig through. So starting with our current enrollment, and keep in mind, when we talk enrollment, it's very important that you keep in mind enrollment fluctuates daily. Um, we have move-ins and move-outs on a daily basis. So the, the current data that I'm gonna share with you is as of last week, Friday. Um, the data that I will share with you in the second part of this is actually data taken from count day, and I do that to be consistent year after year. I can compare the count period to the count period to the count period. Also, the, the information I'm going to share with you is our K-12 data. It doesn't include um, any of our special ed, um, uh, why am I drawing a blank on the name? Um, phases. Our, what's that? Phases and those programs. Um, are we, are you talking about center programs? Center programs. Yeah. Man, thank you, Ben. Center-based programs. It doesn't include any of our um, shared time services. So for a budget number, it will not match with this number. So if you try to match numbers, it doesn't match. This is our K-12 in-person and or Dragon Virtual. All right, so we'll get rolling here. <clears throat> and um, I know in the audience it's gonna be a little bit hard to see uh, some of these, but I will zoom in. Uh, let me see, I need to get your, I'm gonna do this, which will help me be able to jump from sheet to sheet. All right, um, the enrollment number you'll see on the top, this is a header from all of the spreadsheets, so it's on every page, but if you focus on the number, or uh, the title on the bottom, whoops, this is our current enrollment, it's going to <coughs> too much. You have a very touchy mouse here. 
look at the bottom page, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time. This is current enrollment. This is taking into consideration schools of choice, resident, and um, Dragon Virtual. The next sheet you'll see is the current in-person enrollment by building by grade level. You'll see that number, the next number after that. And this is one that may be of interest to you, is our Dragon Virtual. Why are all the boxes with a square on them? I don't know. Um, so you'll see, for instance, at Blanche Sims, we have a total of eight students who are in Dragon Virtual. Um, two of those resident fifth graders, two resident fourth graders, a resident third grader, two resident second graders, one school of choice fourth grader for a total of eight. Interesting to look at the elementaries, pretty consistent, um, right around that eight to 10 number, eight out of Lange Sims, 10 out of Pink Creek, seven from Carpenter, nine stadium and so forth. So I thought that would be some data you guys would find interesting just to kind of see where our uh, Dragon Virtual students are coming from. And then this sheet just gives you a total. Uh, total enrollment, in person, and Dragon Virtual by grade level, where the previous sheets broke it all down by uh, buildings actually. Moving on without it going too quick for me. All right, this gives you a percentage of total resident enrollment in the purple, schools of choice. Then uh, as you recall, or may or may not know, we have an 06 code that are employee children who reside outside of the district, but by uh, legislation, they are allowed to bring their children here. We have the total enrollment numbers then in uh, the peach color, I guess I'd call it, the dragon virtual numbers, and then down below is the, oops, the focus um, we will be bringing to you at a later date, the schools of choice um, recommendation for next year. We usually do that in January slash February. And you know our targets has been 10%. This gives you the idea of where those numbers are by grade level, by building. You'll see that bottom right corner at the elementary level, we're at 9.45% schools of choice as a district, um, keeping within that 10. There are some grade levels that are higher and lower. We look at each classroom after we know what our resident enrollment is. We try to keep it at 10% per grade level, but it also doesn't make a lot of sense to have some empty seats when we could fill those and bring those FTEs into the district. Uh, this is the same information for middle schools. You'll see um, all of the information here. Focus on this number here that I'm circling. Middle school, our combined middle school SOC is 9.97%. So again, under the 10% that uh, is our target. And then we have the high school as well. The high school, as you know, this 6.53. That's the overall percentage of schools of choice currently. That's low because we're working through that system. This is year seven, I believe it is, of schools of choice. We traditionally take them K-8 only with our main focus being kindergarten, first grade. So those grade levels that we started seven, eight years ago taking schools of choice are working their way to the high school. So our high school numbers have always been well below the rest of the district. Right, going too fast on me again. This uh, sheet here I know is of particular interest to some of you. Um, this is our in-person. How can I get rid of those? Why are those little boxes around? I don't know what I did either. To I think it's because you have the editing up on the right. So it's creating your text box and all that. Well, is this one? No. Tools. <coughs> Here. That didn't do it. I don't know what I did there to make it so blurry. I don't wanna do that. Mm -hmm. What's that do? Nope, I don't wanna delete a page. Huh. Well, you have it in front of you, but, um, and when I open the second one, which I'll spend more time on. So, they're gone. Okay, now they're back. <laughs> Um, this is our elementary in-person class size, um, and we monitor this daily. And we've, we've spoke about this before. You'll see that we have what we call our target class sizes and then our contract max. Our target class size is something that we work with curriculum on um, to, you know, uh, you know, an ideal world. For instance, our target class sizes in K and 1 or in K, excuse me, are 23, and then one and two are 25, 
and in grades three through five, then we, we bump that up to 28. We have contract <coughs> maxes of 25, 27, and the next two grade levels in 28. If you look to the far right, anything that you see in green, that's my own little, I, I update this weekly, that is my um, little way of saying, okay, these are classes that are at target or above target, but they are below contract max. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if they are green, for instance, uh, we'll go to the top right, and because it's blurry, I can't see, but that- 25. 25, all right, so there are three sections in that grade level. Our target is 23, our contract max is 25. There's three grades then, are, those three classes are at 25, so they're above target, but they're not above the contract max. When we get above contract max is when we get to talking about bringing in additional support. Typically what we bring in is an overload assistant. And it's, there's a formula based on how many students, how much uh, adult support that they get within that classroom. We currently sit with zero overloads as a district. Um, and we try to keep those overloads to a minimal. Um, we're very happy with the fact that we're at zero. We have 122 total elementary sections currently. 85% of those are below, at or below our target. And 15% are above target, but below contract max. Now, keep in mind we have some Dragon Virtual students who are, yes, target. Just for clarification, Rick, would you just state out loud what those uh, max loads are? Um, kindergarten is 25, first and second is 27 and then third through fifth is 28. This next sheet would be if all Dragon virtual students were actually in person and we maintain the same level of staffing, you will see now one of, uh, we've added three greens, so three grade levels have gone to at target or above, but still below contract max. <coughs> and then we have one grade level at Orion Oaks fourth grade that would have an overload. And that's at 28.67. So there are three sections that would mean two are at 20. One is at 28, two would be at 29. So there would be one student over contract max in two classrooms. Typically we average probably five or so overloads across the district and they come and they go. As we get enrollments, we get an overload. That's those students leave, the overload goes away. So it's always, um, it's always a, a, you know, a difficult thing to, to monitor and keep track of, but as far as class sizes go, um, we feel very, very good about where we're at, and, and I would put us up against uh, any district as far as elementary class sizes. I'm gonna go back up one. And if you look at the bottom right corner of each building, that's the building average. So for instance, Blanche Sims, we currently average 22.47 kids per class. And across the board, um, our high, I think, is 24.19, which is at Pink Creek. Um, for elementaries, that's pretty good numbers. Rick, really quick, is this um, data based on the December numbers or the October? This is, uh, if you look at the top, this was pulled last Friday, 12-1. Okay. So you. I update this um, every week. Allison sends me uh, the data on Monday. I have a spreadsheet that... Um, has about, uh, this is about half of the tabs on the spreadsheet for this particular weekly um, update that I do. Over the course of time, I keep adding to it and changing formulas and getting things moved around. And, and so we monitor this weekly. Perfect. Um, it's you. cabinet we meet um, once a week and that's a standing and agenda item on our cabinet. I want to make a point this out is nothing to do with you and your data other than that there are think tanks out there that look at districts and come up with completely different numbers. And some of them are using our numbers and then dividing it by every teacher in the building, meaning they add every teacher who doesn't have a classroom right. into the number and they dilute the numbers. And then they accuse public schools of complaining that because they will say, no, their, their student ratio is much smaller than they're claiming, but it's, it's twisted data. This is the raw data that represents what's happening in Lake Orion classrooms. So this is the kind of the, the end all be all of how we try to staff and what we target for buildings. You asked earlier, Birgit, about the contract maxes and targets. You'll see the bottom um, little box there. There's our target numbers and our contract max. 
And above that, you'll see our building capacity calculations. So we look at every building and we calculate the number of rooms available in that building for gen ed um, educational purposes. Now we have to back out, for instance, like in our Orient Oaks, we utilize some full-size classrooms for special education. So those do come out. So for instance, Blanche Sims, we have 19 classrooms available for gen ed um, students. We take a number of 28, and that would be maxing out every classroom at 28, and we use that as our multiplier. And then I take that 28 and I multiply that by 0.96% or 96%. If you take the, the um, target contract max numbers down below, if you do an average of 25, 27, 27, 28, 20, it actually comes out to be 26. 96% of that number is actually 26. I could use 26 as our target, but really it's 28. So if you look at the number of classrooms we have at Blanche Sims, we have 19. So the maximum number of students would be 532, take 96% of that. Our target for that building, if we were operating at full capacity, would be 511 students. The number on that next row down below is the percentages. If you take the 511 and we run all the way across and we got 3,333 3, 3, students as our target, what percentage of that would be at Blanche Sims, what percentage would be at Carpenter and so forth. When we staff, and especially when we did our dist redistricting and so forth, those are the target numbers we're looking at. You know, we want to try to put 15% of our elementary students at Blanche Sims, 16% at Carpenter. And you'll see um, the data, we're, we're actually pretty close to um, where that sits. Um, I mentioned earlier that we have 122 current elementary sections. Um, we have 124 <coughs> classrooms across the district available. So we're utilizing 122 out of the 140, 124 elementary available classrooms. We purposely left one open at stadium this year because of the remodel and reconstruction of the front entrance and how that worked out. And we have one available at Carpenter that is not being utilized, that could be. It's not not being utilized, we're utilizing it for other things at this time, but it is available to us if we did need to add a classroom. So our capacity, if you recall, at Bland Sims, we shoot for 511. Our current enrollment there is 435. So our capacity without schools of choice, if we just calculated in the residents, we would be utilizing about 76% of capacity at that building. Once we put in our SOC numbers, that bumps that up to 85%. So with SOC and resident enrollment, we're utilizing 85% of the capacity that we have at Blanche Sims. And if you go across to the far right here, you'll see that with SOC and residents, we're at about 87% capacity of our elementaries. Um, and then I put, put it in here, dra uh, backing out our Dragon Virtual, so current actual in-person kind of shows you where the percentages are. Down below that is our middle school capacities. You'll see those numbers are based on the Plant and Moran study that we did in 2016. They came in, did the similar uh, calculations of 28 students per classroom, um, calculated the number of gen ed classrooms that we have, and our building capacities as they sit are 784, 924, 924. You can see there then our capacity without uh, schools of choice, capacities with schools of choice, and then backing out Dragon Virtual. So uh, yes, we're, uh, there are plenty of room in our middle schools, but it would be very difficult if we were to reduce two middle to two, reduce two two middle schools at this time. Um, we would have two very packed middle schools for some time, especially with teams, right? Yes, especially with teams. Rick, as I recall, <clears throat> when we had that Plant Marine Cressa study done, one of the things the board noticed as a weakness in that was a, a different perspective on a definition of the classroom. Yes. So my concern is what our true classroom availability is on the middle school. I would be interested in knowing what that is. How you were able to present to us 120, or I'm sorry, 124 available classrooms on elementary and what we're utilizing. Do we actually know what the numbers are? In the middle for schools, the middle for schools. classrooms that are being utilized for instructional purposes? We're, and actually, not I, what Plamer and Cresses are. That, I would tell you that what's actually being utilized is probably 98%. We don't have empty classrooms sitting around. The capacity is really related to the fact that 
we'll have classes in the middle schools of 20 or 22. Right. Where the capacity for that classroom is 28. So we're, we're already down, you know, uh, what is that, 15, 18% or more of capacity. So we utilize, there's not to my, and, and I'm in all the, I can't think of a middle school that Understood. has a classroom sitting in. I'm just curious for the accuracy of numbers of availability since you're basing on plan we're in. That's all I'm yeah. asking. And, and again, that was something that was provided to us if and when we decided we wanted to really do a hardcore study of the capacity of those buildings, my recommendation would be to work with instruction and, and really do our own capacity assessment based on our criteria, not just packing 28 kids in each classroom. That, that would sense? be, for the middle level, that would be something I would be interested in because I've, if it's interesting to hear that with only about 400 students at Oakview that we would, that we're using every classroom because are, are we running two full teams at Oakview? What's, what, what is? Yes, remember at the middle school level, your programming takes into a huge account of, of how we're, how we're running classrooms. So, um. Yeah, each core content, remember, has a classroom. Yes, we're running two teams at each at each grade level. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what the study does not take into account. Right. So that's why it, we have to be very cautious because any movement within the middle school, you would have to look at the programming. Yeah, the bigger, the bigger part of that, what I remember was that we have rooms like art and music that Plant Moran said you could, you could put a sixth grade math class in there. Sure. And so if we if we looked at our capacity at the middle level the way we want to use it, the way we as a we as a board have worked with administration for years to say we do want dedicated program, you know, space mm -hmm. for computer classrooms, art classrooms, mm -hmm. you know, music band, etc. So how many classrooms are left because uh, the concern is this this middle school capacity and um, we're going through a strategic plan, uh, but on the other side, we are ready to break ground on a new elementary school. So we're, you know, as a board, we're going to be asked to, you know, approve bids, you know, shortly for, you know, nearly $20 million to build a new building. But have we, are we absolutely certain that we need to replace that capacity, that there isn't something else we could do with configurations that would allow us to use our existing space. So that's just as we go f towards that sure. formal yeah. approval, ma you know, making sure that we're not going to be in a situation where within three to five years we are closing a building, and that that wouldn't that wouldn't sit right. I, I can tell you that's not going to happen. Yeah, it, it wouldn't sit right with us as well. And <clears throat> we actually have talked about a number of different scenarios. Uh, we do need the uh, need the elementary, and that's why we move forward with it. Uh, certainly, the strategic plan may give us a um, a different look at uh, as we move forward in the future, and that might provide some opportunities. I think that's the piece that we really have to you know be aware of uh, as we move forward. I think one other thing you might remember is when we um, discussed changes at Carpenter. <coughs> and we looked to those elementary numbers, we did it in such a way that would allow us to expand uh, the footprint of Carpenter because we anticipated growth. And if we look at the, once the, the district numbers stabilize, I think that we then start looking toward that slow climb in growth again, and I think uh, we're not too far from that, are we, Rick? No, I don't think so. The other thing, I th and I don't want to discount Plan Moran by any means because the, what the service they provided for us was very beneficial. But if you recall, their recommendation at that time was to close two elementaries. Right. And cabinet and administration fought very hard saying that's, that's impossible. We can't do that. Had we went with their suggestion, we wouldn't have the room in our elementaries mm -hmm. currently. Um, and we wouldn't have we Weber. Would have, we would have we would have had to have cut way back on schools of choice, and even then, we would be busting at the seams at the elementary. So, yeah. And that's where our imbalance that I look at is that that you showed we're 87 percent full at the elementary level, which is just it's you can't you, you can't hit every class. They don't magically show up to fill every classroom we exactly can't go out to and the buy target. We can't place them where we want. Exactly. Right. But at the middle level, 
even given the capacities. We were running our middle levels for years at roughly 600 students per grade, which was great, 200 in each middle school filling two teams. But when you look, we only have 500 kids roughly per grade, it makes that middle level difficult. And I, and I love the team teaching concept that we use, but to understand what does that, what does that mean from a facilities and a, and a, all, the, all the issues, as we go to break ground on, a, on another elementary, I, I don't want to offer, you know, put things out there that are speculation, but it would just be making sure that all of the capacity that we have is being effectively utilized. And when I see the Oakview numbers where we're under 400 students, that just causes concern to say, okay. Well, if you look at the uh, middle school capacities as well, you'll see that there is an imbalance in buildings, and that may be part of the conversation about how and you get more balance. We may need to reconsider redistricting the middle schools. Correct. Which um, not all elementaries feed one middle school. Right. Some do. Some it's a split. Mm -hmm. um, if you recall, when we went through the whole redistricting, we had some focuses that we committed to to the community, one being that we wouldn't split neighborhoods up. Some districts do that. You'll have a subdivision where half the subdivision goes to one school and another half goes to another. We worked very hard to make sure that didn't happen. Um, so, Did you wave to us? I'm sorry. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> a little bit <laughs> waves right where. Um, so, you know, at some point we may consider uh, looking at those middle schools and balancing them out to be 500 per instead of 600, 600, 400 or 700, 600, 400. Um, that may be consideration that, that uh, we, we take. Um, that's always difficult, as you know, we experience when someone is asked to change <coughs> buildings. Um, it's, uh, it's difficult on people, some people anyway, mainly the adults. I think what Rick's really divulging is we've talked about a lot of different scenarios surfacing it, it is something that's on our radar and, and uh, we'll continue to look for solutions. Yeah, and, and that's what I expect, is that, that the number of things that you discuss, you know, they, they need, it needs to be concrete because as Rick said, the, that it's a big move to suggest something to us to say, can we redistrict? So, you know, being prudent, looking at it constantly, I'll, I know that you, you will bring us the best recommendations when, when the time comes. All right, I'm going to move on then to if, if there are no other questions on our current status. Everybody feels comfortable about where we're at? Okay. Um, moving on to then some historical data and some projections data, um, kind of comparing where we've been and looking at where we think we're going to be. Um, and I've shared this with you each of the years that I've been here. This goes back to 2001, 2002 school year. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of those, but I will focus for you on this current year. And let me see if I can get it to move. It's not going to let me move, is it? Um, I'm going to focus on this bottom right box here. So what this is, this, this demonstrates where we were last year to where we're at this year. And we'll start at the top. If it's blue, obviously there wasn't a last year. So the column to the right where my cursor is here, 21-22, this is current enrollment. Again, I'll, I'll preface that by saying at the time of count. So the previous data that I shared with you will look different than what's here. We've had ads and drops and ads and drops daily since that time. Um, so obviously um, incoming DK this year was 76. Our kindergarten class is 420. I'm gonna come back and talk about that in just a minute. But then from there you'll see um, kindergarten to first, so last year's K number was 348. This year's K number is 383. So we actually, that class grew by 35 students. But if you recall this last year when, when the pandemic really had an effect on schools, you'll see all of these are in red from last year, the transition from the year before to the next year. But we, we regained 35 students from kindergarten to first, or we gained. We gained 25 from first to second, 17 and so forth. We did lose from 10th to 11th and 11th to 12th, but the grand total from last year's kindergarten to last year's 11th grade, that cohort moving forward, we actually picked up 108 students that moved in, whatever the case may be. Two moved in, one moved out, but we're up a plus 108. 
the numbers on the bottom and this um, this is how we get to our our kindergarten calculation. You'll see that last year over here we had 57 DK kids. So their birth year as DK kids put them in DK, but this year they're part of that 420 kindergartner. So they're really not new K because we count DK and K together. So if you look down below here, I've got the new K of 367, the previous DK of 57. So that then gives you that 420. So the new K plus the DK is 439. Um, our K plus DK count actually is 496. So for John's purposes, if you go up above, you got 420 of K, 76 DK. That count or kindergarten count is actually 496, right around that class size of 500 that we talk about. So you'll see the percentages over here. That's the data that we really focus on. And I break that down further because we've talked about this several times. You know, the, the, I, I don't use the term losing enrollment. I've used the term since I've been with you that we age out. And if you look back through the historical data, we were having class sizes in the 650s um, for years. And our class sizes now are in the 500s. And we age out. So if you look to the left here, this is our historical data for kindergarten enrollment. And it's a plus minus from the previous year. I shared with you the data earlier. We're actually 111 kindergarten students up this year from where we were a year ago. And we had a lot of those that didn't enroll last year's kindergarten. If you recall the year, last year though, we were down 135 because we had people that didn't want to enroll. They were gonna wait a year because of what was going on. But you'll also see below that there's a three year average. And that three year average is we're up about 4.6%. You got a five year average and a 10 year average. Here's the number that I really like to focus on is our entering kindergarten to our exiting seniors. We graduate 650, but we bring in 500. So we automatically are down 150 over the total count because that incoming kindergarten class is 150 smaller than the outgoing seniors. And we've talked about that working its way through and our classes are starting to level off as Jim mentioned just a minute ago. So the enrollment change then for last year to this year, and if I go back up here, this you'll see the 651 I'm circling here was our K-12 count last year. This year, 645. So we're actually down six, but you, you go back and you look at the aging out is 114 of that, right? Our incoming kindergarten to our out exiting seniors. But if you come over here, we picked up 108 to help offset that. So that 108 and that 114, the difference being six. So we're picking up some of those students that we lose through the aging out process in grades, grades K through 11. So I'll share with you in just a moment, most of our classes when they start with us as kindergartners grow and graduate with more students than what they started with. And that is what we look for as a district. We're not losing students, we're actually gaining some students. What we're not getting is that class size and that's consistent across the county. And I'll share with you our capture rate and so forth in just a moment. Um, so uh, let me just uh, jump in here. W would it be safe to say that the net effect when you take into the the age, aging out component, yeah. that the net effect is what we're seeing here is enrollment growth? Yes, I would say so. We, we tend to pick up students K, K through 11. Can I, ton. can I just add on, bounce off of that thought process, um, and give just a little bit of a different perspective on that. When I look at this page, this previous page to this, mm -hmm. um, and you look at the 19, 20, 20, 21 school year, and all of that on our page looks red. It doesn't look red up there, but it, it's right red. Mm -hmm. So everything was in the negative. Yep, yes, that was the COVID last year, year in the yep. COVID year. Yep. Correct. So if I compare that, so it's easy to say we've we've gained. You know. It, uh, objectively speaking, when you've lost, it's easy to say you've gained. But to look at the next year, I don't see quite the matching percentage increase from what the loss is. So would you say that we have picked up, I don't know that for sure that we have regained any, everything that we've lost. Well, no, we have not regained right. everything. But I think, Birgit, if you take this 108, which is our gain K-12 this year, if you pull out 259 was the loss last year, and that's an anomaly. But go back to the previous year there were 70 additional students K-11. 
The year before that, there were 81. The year before that, 35, 36. We've had this steady increase of K through 11. That's the trend line. Yes, each yeah. year. Okay. Um, and again, our incoming classes are not as big as what we Correct. had, and I'll share that historical data with you in just a moment too. Any questions on that? All right. Um, you'll see here, uh, these are the boxes I really like to focus on as I just shared with you. Um, and then we'll move on to um, some projections. So kindergarten obviously is difficult to project. You know, they, they don't tell us that they're coming until we do kindergarten roundup. But one of the things that we do do is we track very closely the birth rates within Oakland County. And we know over time that we consistently capture, if you would, a certain percentage of the number of live births from that particular year. So this top row here is the enrollment year. So back in 2006, you'll see there were 624 kindergarten enrollment that year. And if you kind of follow that enrollment across, you'll see a steady kind of decline, 624, 515, and it starts working its way down. These 372 and 392s were some pretty low years, but there's some explanation for that. If you come here, this is their current grade levels. Um, and then you'll look at the county births. So in the year 2001, there were 15,867 births in Oakland County. So we'll take that number across and you'll see below that the red, that was down 2%, 2.37% from the previous year. If you follow the, the numbers across, you will see the Oakland County birth rates in red, mo are mostly in red, excuse me. That there's been a steady decline from the 15,000 back in 2001 to let's say um, our current kindergarten class and their birth year then would be uh, current grade of K would be in 2000 and birth year 16, 2016. So that 13 to 15,000, that's, that's 2,000 students. What we do then is we look at the percentage change, which is there, and then I look at the capture rate. So this line here is what percentage of that birth rate for that year have we enrolled? So back in 2001, we were capturing 3.93% of the total births in the county. And you'll see that number as we go across has remained pretty consistent. And down below, you'll see that I do a three year, a five year and a 10 year average for our capture rate. So our capture rate remains pretty consistent. So what that tells you is our reduction in the incoming kindergarten has a direct uh, correlation to the number of births in the county. The county birth rate is down, our kindergarten enrollment is down at the same rate or close to it. So you'll see those um, birth rates here um, and the plus or minuses, here's the change in the capture rates. If it's red, we captured a little bit less that year. Most often that is less than 1% except for last year um, was the first time that it actually exceeded um, us not gaining and, and actually losing about 1% um, from the previous year. Um, this year, our current kindergarten was actually up a half percent from the previous year. These numbers to the right then are what I use to calculate, and this is as far as I can get birth rate. Um, <coughs> this is how we focus on what our kindergarten capture rate should look or would look like for the next three years to kind of plan for the next three years. I use a three year rolling average. I take that to come up with a calculation and you'll see then this row here, I take and I look at the anticipated number of kindergartners backing out the graduating class size that we currently have for that grade. And you'll see the difference again of this aging out. We're still gonna be aging out over the next three years, 103, 150, and 139. That's not changed yet. It'll start to change I think after four more years where we'll really start to see a change. Um, when I work with John, we, do, we work on projections. 399 was the projection um, enrollment. Actually, when I work with John, that number, I think we, we did 409 this year because I, I calculated it um, a little differently. But that's kind of our target for budgeting for the next year. So that 399, you'll see we actually came in at 439, so we are about 40 above what we anticipated this year. Uh, for budget purposes, I think we were about 36 above, so it was somewhere in that neighborhood. All right. Any questions on county birth rates, how we kind of forecast for kindergarten? 
how we compare in the county that adverse relationship between birth rates in the county and what happens with our kindergarten and it's not just a phenomenon to us it's unique not just to us but it's a county-wide issue all right um, this next set of data um, this is enrollment change by building yes you know does one building stick out more than another uh, is there something that you know some underlying condition we're not familiar with that we need to look into so that's why we keep and track that data nothing stands out on this sheet really for us that uh, is of any concern this is what I spoke about earlier when kids come to us um, in kindergarten so this is our senior class up here on the top left when they enrolled way down here in 910 there were 528 kids in that grade through that they have you know bounced up and down throughout their you know, the, the cohort as a current senior class they're at 542 so they started with 528 they're at 542 they're up 14 kids as you work your way across you'll see our juniors are up five our sophomores are down our freshman class is 38 bigger than when they started as kindergartners um, our eighth grade at three so it's up and down but the vast majority of them are up our fourth grade is 44 higher than it was when they started with us as kindergarten um, if you took out last year especially at the elementary that overall number we grow at every elementary grade level so for instance um, let's talk about third grade you take this 42 out from a year ago and that minus two now becomes a positive 40 because that one year kind of had that that significant negative impact on us as a district i can't stress this enough we gain students k-11 every year people come to us in grades k-11 our issue is our kindergarten numbers and that's directly related to what's going on in the county and birth rates and it's not comparable to where it was 10 or 15 years ago there's just not as many kindergartners in Oakland County as there used to be. That's so. part of the explanation for the growth by the time they graduate. Yes. Okay. I think that's actually. I think that's actually true for the state. And if I recall, um, some doing a presentation several years back. It's true for the um, region, particularly so, and that the largest influx of people was immigrants in the area. So it was the, the birth rates were not having a large impact on anything. And was it gonna largely impact our workforce? Sure. Now, I say that we're growing. I wouldn't, based on the percentage, I wouldn't really constitute it in my opinion as growth. I would constitute it as we remain very flat. You know, 30, 40 kids in, in the scheme of things, you know, the 14 seniors, when you're talking starting with 528, 14 what percentage is that jake quick um 14 john um, yeah it's like you know so we, we've got it small you know i would like to say that our enrollment for the most part remains very flat it comes and goes comes and goes but we're not losing students um and i hope we've changed that narrative over the last five years or so because that wasn't the narrative for a long time right the the, the thought was that because the total number of enrollment was going down steadily that we were losing students and we're really not losing students I think the other piece that I know we talked about before is it's very expensive to live here and as far as entry-level homes or, or things like that a lot of times those are the people that are having yeah. the kids at first and they're not necessarily here this is their this is people's destinations that's why you know we grow later in their in their school career yep second and third purchased homes yep. A lot of our kindergarten students um, come to us and enroll with siblings that are coming for the first time. Um, and to play off of Scott's, Anna, can you turn off? To play off of your point, that when we have had schools of choice come in, a lot of those parents aim to live here. They do. And some successfully manage that. Over the, so schools of choice has been attractive for our community. Yep. Yeah, we skipped that slide, but but when it shows that our school of choice retention we didn't always lose those students. Mm -hmm. If they move here, they fall out of school of choice. And, yeah, and, and I'll yeah. get to SOC yeah. in just yeah. a minute here. Yeah. Um, any questions on how, how students um, tend to stay with us? So here's the SOC data. You'll see back when we started the SOC program in 14, 15. Um, the current grade level over here, so in eighth grade, the kids that are currently in eighth grade is when we started SOC. 
That year, if I come over here, we took 64 kids. Do you see where I'm circling the 64? Um, the following year, um, <clears throat> there were 15 kids that were enrolled that, in that grade, two, one, and we go across. So uh, I was probably a little too high, wasn't I? It's, so let's go eighth grade. This year, we took seven eighth graders. As seventh graders, we took five, and I go across and across and across. There's been a total of 70 kids enrolled in our current eighth grade class over the years. You look perplexed there, so. No, I'm, I'm concentrating. Yep. All right. <laughs> Not perplexed. What we currently have is 43 students in that grade level of SOC. So we've enrolled over the course of the last eight years, 70 kids in that particular grade. Each year, a little different number. 43 of them are still with us. So we've retained 61% of the schools of choice kids. And that's a pretty consistent number. About 65% of the students in SOC stay with us. Now, those that don't, there are a number of reasons. As Birgit mentioned, many um, find residency here. Some find that it is a commitment to be a schools of choice family in this district. Certainly. Um, because we don't give them options of buildings. And um, we do the best we can when we get SOC. I look at residents, I look at addresses, I use a map, I put pins on the map, and I'm, okay, which elementary is closest to this home? And where can we get them? And we don't always, we're not always able to get them to the closest place. And so they do have to drive. It's, it's a commitment. And um, so 65%, I will tell you, across the state is pretty high for schools of choice students and retention. Um, so, for instance, our current kindergarten here, we're at 48, so that well, let's not do that one. Let's do first grade. We took 10 first graders this year. Um, we took 31 last year as kindergartners, a total of 41. There are 32 of those kids remaining. So you could do the math and go backwards, and that 31, um, we lost, uh, so 41 and 32, nine of those kids basically from a year ago. But what we, but what we don't track of, of is some of those nine may now be resident they students. May. Yep. So the retention rate is at least 64%. Right. right. But if we entice them to live here, even better. Yeah. Correct. That, you know, they liked it so much going to the schools they moved here, which is, was a, was something I don't think we considered when School of Choice started, but it really is, has been a blessing to the community to, to attract new families. So I know John loves this number here. This this is our current enrollment of SOC 587. And John, I'll have you do the quick math. If we didn't have those 587 students at roughly $8,000 a student, um, if I'm doing my math correctly, it's about $4 million. $4.7 million. I get the calculator going. <laughs> I'll go with you. I'll go Just with to you. say, uh, I, th I think we have demonstrated that schools of choice serves us well. We don't over rely on it, if that makes sense. Um, capping or keeping it at that 10% allows us to fill empty seats within classrooms without adding staff. That's one of the commitments we've made over the years to you as a board and to the community. We won't create a new section to take in 30 more schools of choice students. When the schools of choice lottery happens and exists, we look at current resident enrollment and we see one classroom that has 18 residents and another classroom that has 22 we may put six SOC in one classroom and only two in another. And, but our target is always to maintain that 10% target, and I think we've done a pretty, pretty doggone good job with that, and we've been able to backfill a lot of seats that may have sat empty. And that $4 million. 5.1 million. What is it? 5.1 million. 5.1 million dollars to our, uh, our budget. That's a significant number. Um, so I think Schools of Choice has served us well. And we'll continue. And again, I, I can't stress it on. Um, I, we haven't gone overboard with it, which with some districts that I'm very familiar with have, um, with percentages in the 30 plus. Yeah. So the and I mean, even a couple of years ago, before I was on the board, the board decided to close a school as opposed to let's try to bump up our school of choice to keep the building full. So it has been designed to fill excess capacity but not a desperate attempt to keep everything you know full okay 
So the other thing I want to point out about schools of choice as we move on, and we agreed to cap that percentage uh, a couple years ago at 10%, as you all know, as our enrollment number has been getting smaller, albeit leveling off, it naturally made that number smaller. Correct. So um, just a thought process as we consider schools of choice futuristically yeah. thinking. And exactly for the administration to say that if that number, for some reason, the number works out better that it's 12 or 14, right. we would expect that you would you would come to us and say, you know, where where is the right number to be? So it, it's it's been 10% but that doesn't mean it always has to stay 10%. And I think what you saw with capacity and percentages, mm -hmm. it, it's working well for us right now. That 85% across the board with elementaries and where we're at, you know, some are at 92 or whatever. Our buildings don't feel cramped, but they also don't feel empty. The, the classrooms and the class sizes are working well for us. Um, uh, I, I had a question related sure. to that and you've been doing it a long time, is there a sweet spot for that percentage of occupied classroom that speaks to uh, the best operating uh, level? Uh, you know, like a business that operates at 100% has problems right. because sometimes you go over 100% and you don't have the capability to stay flexible, serve the customer, so on and so forth. Is there a number? Is that 85% that, that number? I think if that number got over 90 to 92%, we would start to feel it. Okay. So That's the 85 is just about on that number. I think we're very close to our sweet spot. Okay. You can see, once again, we're utilizing 122 out of 124 elementary classrooms. We don't have overloads. We have class sizes that are in the you know average of 22 to 24 in our elementaries. All of those numbers are, and I don't want to speak for Heidi, I think in her world are optimal or work well. Um, so again, I think we're utilizing our facilities well. We're, we're not feeling cramped, but we're also, you know, there's not space sitting around empty. It allows us to do a lot of the programming that we wanna do based on space. Um, I think we're in a good place. I think we've leveled off our enrollment. Um, as uh, Scott had mentioned, uh, I do believe people seek us out to enroll here and intentfully look to, to purchase homes here. And in the past, I shared with you real estate data of home sales and, and so forth, and the market's been a little crazy. Um, <laughs> it's, it's difficult to buy homes now, so I went on long enough as usual um, when we talk about this, but I know it's important to you, and I added that other step with our current enrollment, so I didn't talk about real estate this time around, but I think that has demonstrated in the past too. Um, we, we, we do get a lot of second and third home, mm -hmm. second or third home that people are buying. They buy a starter home somewhere else. They're in their profession for a handful of years. It's time to upgrade. They've got some little ones. They, they move into our community, enroll with school-aged children and maybe a couple that are not quite school-aged yet, and then we get them later as kindergartners. Excellent. Other questions for Rick? That's a good starting point for what we tackle down the road here. I think I might have exceeded my 10 minutes. Ben, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't think anybody expected you to very stay much. at 10 minutes. No. Yeah. Is that the HR guy asking for Very overtime? thorough and very good. <laughs> All right, thank you, Rick. So we'll move on to uh, public participation. Uh, related to action items on the agenda. We have no one signed up for that tonight, so we'll move ahead to strategic area discussion items. Sure. And uh, Ben. All right, I have a variety of uh, different items here to uh, recognize. The first, I just wanted to let the board know that Julie will be emailing you the um, board officer questionnaire that we created last year about your interest in the committees and in your interest in the uh, respective offices in preparation of our organizational meeting next month. So you'll get those, she'll give you some directions, but she'll help compile those and have those available um, at our organizational meeting. 
Also wanted to mention that strategic planning, uh, we did uh, change our input sessions to uh, be after uh, the January date. So starting, I believe, the week of January 10th, we'll start back up with our in-person meetings uh, for the input sessions. The uh, website is still open uh, for people to uh, give input that way. Uh, but again, we'll start on January 10th. That won't compromise or change our February 5th um, a date that we all have on the, on the Saturday. So please make sure you keep to have that available on your calendars. Um, and that will be a, an important day for all of us. Uh, as far as the legislative update, there are a few things. Um, House Bill 4981, uh, uh, in that bill there's an increase in the commissions uh, to lottery retailers, uh, and that comes to the expense of the school revenue. So that's one uh, that is really important uh, to schools. Uh, so we need to keep our keep our eyes on that and, and be um, vigilant with that. House Bill 5523, uh, that's a budget uh, supplemental, and the, really the only education-related um, item in that is uh, about $300 million in federal funds that go to MDHHS uh, to help uh, purchase COVID-19 tests for school districts. Uh, I, that's what I believe in preparation likely for the uh, vaccination for employees and there are some schools that are doing routine testing um, around COVID, uh, but that is the, really the only um, dollars that will end up flowing uh, indirectly uh, to schools for those that uh, choose to go that route. House Bill uh, 4294, um, that is a bill that's related to employing substitute teachers. Obviously that has been um, a challenge for a few years and, and it'll continue to be a challenge. Uh, but what it does is it gives flexibility for those that are already employees to uh, have them be substitute teachers, even if they aren't certified um, or permitted. And so that gives a little bit of flexibility. Um, important to note that that, that bill is uh, to expire June 30th of 2022, so it's a short-term solution. Uh, but many people are facing uh, significant uh, staffing issues, uh, and substitute teachers is certainly one of those areas. Uh, House Bill 4293 is also related to that. Uh, basically, it um, puts in some language around um, there being a prohibited topic for those individuals that go into the substituting that are currently our employees with that previous bill. So it just basically allows uh, districts to utilize that option uh, without having um, uh, collective bargaining agreement issues. House Bill 5522 is a bill, um, approximately $368 million for public safety and law enforcement. And uh, really the, the purpose behind that is to give grants uh, to school districts for school resource officers. Uh, so that's one I think that would be, you know, obviously really important. It's really timely. Um, many districts are not as fortunate as us to have the relationships that we have with um, the village police as well as the, um, the county police department. So. Um, but that uh, we'll keep an eye on that because that certainly can make an impact uh, for improvements as well. House Bill 4398, uh, this is a bill that was passed uh, by both chambers. Uh, it's waiting for the uh, governor um, for consideration and approval. Within that bill, there is uh, $10 million uh, for the Teach America program, um, which really is, again, a support for uh, getting more teachers uh, into the pipeline. And then there's another $6 million uh, for partnerships in response for manufacturing education. So a few, few good things uh, coming down the line, but we'll see if how they you know, end up uh, you know, panning out. So any questions on any of those? All right. We'll do a quick uh, COVID-19 update, which is um, just our, just our typical uh, that we've kind of been going through. I think many people are well aware, but just because I've uh, continued to do this, I just want to make sure I'm um, putting these data points in front of you for consistency sake. But as you can see, the last two uh, numbers in that uh, string of numbers, 106.3, that was our per 10,000 um, rate uh, last Thursday, and the one prior to that was an improvement, of, and that was 96.1. So that was an improvement from the week prior, but you can see last week it went up. I would suggest that the one coming up um, tomorrow would, would be an improvement uh, based on the zip, zip code numbers that I, that I look at. Um, I think it was yesterday, either yesterday or the day before, was the first time that all six of the zip codes that I uh, track were all in a positive, meaning that they dropped from previous. So um, hopefully we're on our way down, um, but, but we will see. 
The positivity rate is 14.6, that's for the county, um, as of uh, December 12th. And I think it was 15 exactly when we met on the first. So um, it went up from the first and then back down. So we're, we are yet to 14.6 as a county. And then the last thing, just as a reminder, uh, the health order, the, the metric that's being used is the um, the risk levels. Again, it's supposed to be in a uh, the lower risk level for 14 days um, or a notice from the health officer to this point in our weekly meetings. There's been no, um, no hint or change that there's any metrics change or any different factors. Uh, so I don't anticipate anything, uh, certainly not as we come back um, in January, uh, but uh, our current count is uh, 446.5 out of the 100,000. And as a reminder, we need to be um, under 100. So we are a long ways off uh, for that. And then 14.6% uh, uh, is a positivity rate and the um, rate that it needs to be at is 10% or less. Keep in mind, just as a reminder, because I haven't said this in a while, it's the higher of those two, whether it's the per 100,000 or the positivity rate that dictates which risk level you're in. So um, we're, we're a long ways off uh, to get to where we need to be for the health order to be removed. So just to give everybody an update on that. Those were the areas that I typically address. Any questions about that at all? All right. I also wanted to uh, give a, a little bit of a school safety and security. Might not be so little bit, but um, I do want to talk about that a little bit. Um, obviously, it's been uh, you know something that has been on the minds of many, and as well it should be. And it's it is something that's you know always on our mind as school administrators. Um, and I just I want to reiterate a couple of things. One is that all the threats um, and concerns that we get are investigated deeply, um, you know, by us and in collaboration with the police. Uh, there are a number of threats that have been reported to the police, hundreds. Uh, they do a great job of communicating with us, working through them. We get them at 4.30 in the morning. We get them at 11.30 at night. When they come in, they come in and we start dealing with it um, and, and try to make the best decisions uh, with the information that we have. School uh, security and safety is, is a layered approach, and I think that's really important to understand there's not one solution to all uh, situations. We prepare for many different scenarios, um, but we do have a layered uh, approach to, to try to empower um, our staff so that we can respond appropriately. Um, you know, it's a continual process with safety and, um, you know, this tragedy that we just had with our neighbors, you know, certainly that created more ur urgency for, for us as well as, as well as others. And it's really caused us to review everything. Um, and we do typically cyclically go through and review, uh, various items and, and whatnot. Um, as the emergency response manuals on the wall, as you know, we did those in the fall and those are in all of our rooms. Uh, we just had the emergency operation plans, uh, approved last month that were, um, uh, done in collaboration with the police and they have input on that and you reviewed that as well. Um, so I just wanted to uh, make sure to bring that to the attention. Um, but again, I think it's really important for people to understand that there's no one strategy or process that satisfies all of the uh, needs that an organization has when you're dealing with safety and security because there's just so many things that can happen when you have so many people uh, in the facilities. As far as um, you know, the, the core uh, area, it, it's really important for our staff and they do have really strong relationships. That is how you really identify when students are struggling, when there are challenges and then acting upon that. Um, what is it that we, that we can do to support students? Uh, oftentimes when students are part of a group, it really makes a uh, more of a positive experience for those students and it's really important because it also puts another um, adult in their life, um, you know, to, to, want, to monitor and to help them grow. Um, and it's really important also to understand that when there are social emotional issues, you know, we have staff that are um, more cognizant of what all those uh, signs are and whatnot. And there's referrals that are made, there's threat assessments that are completed. Uh, and certainly we uh, cooperate again with our police and administration when our staff um, is dealing with, with troubling types, be, types of behavior. Um, just as a reminder, currently, you, uh, 
you know, what we have had in place. We have building alarms, and you think, everybody's thinking of the of the one uh, tragedy that just occurred, but again, there's so many different things that can happen. So um, this district put building alarms in quite some time ago, and that's a, um, a very good deterrent uh, for some of the acts that can happen in an organization. We have the two school resource officers. We're very blessed to have them. Um, and the village uh, police is very active uh, at Blanche Sims as well. Um, always has been, and I, I feel very strongly that their commitment is there for uh, the future as well. We have uh, Safe Ed in uh, three of our buildings. Uh, those are additional people with training uh, around security. Um, our bond uh, that our community had passed really uh, allowed the uh, safe and secure entries in many of our buildings and we'll continue to improve those. Uh, but that is a great uh, way to, um, you know, really delay if there is any, any type of issues. Um, all of our exterior doors um, are locked. Our classroom doors are expected to be locked so that they can, or, or they lock from the inside. So we have uh, quick locking mechanisms uh, for, our, for our staff. Some of them we have to lock from the outside. So their strategy is to keep the doors locked at all times as they're shut. Um, so there's just different things, little things that happen in a classroom to provide uh, safety. Our staff has been trained in uh, ALICE. Um, Again, it's uh, alert, lockdown, inform, counter, and evacuate. And uh, through that training, it, um, you know, it really empowers staff to make decisions when these various things occur. So many think about uh, an intruder type situation, but those are just, that's just one situation um, that we train for. The ALICE training is, uh, they get an annual recertification where they actually have to go through and, and uh, refresh um, those policies, or excuse me, those strategies. Um, our police, uh, in partnership with the police, they have the ability to have keys uh, for our buildings. Um, they have the key cards. Uh, we have video surveillance in all of our buildings. Um, and I talked about the updated plans that we had in place uh, in the fall. Um, really important to understand that we've really taken a deep dive and looked at things from all angles. Um, we've really been working uh, tirelessly. We've heard lots of feedback from staff. We had staff in on that Friday that we had the cancellation due to the, the threats across the county. Um, there was some really terrific feedback from staff, one about giving them the time to do that, and then also they got put in their environments to really look through, okay, if I had to use my ALICE strategies, what are some things that I would do and how do I, how do I barricade and, and what kind of things would I use for a counter and those types of things. Lots of uh, conversations happen at the building level and, and thankfully uh, that funneled to us so then we can, we can help support and act on that. Uh, we're also reviewing um, our threat and risk protocols. So when um, students do uh, behaviors that might be alarming, uh, so it's very clear. And again, we're reviewing it to see if there's ways to improve it, to look at what best practices are, so that we're making sure that we are uh, supporting every student in every situation. These uh, badges we have, as you know, from the, uh, the opening, we gave all of our staff these, uh, these lanyards on it. It says relationships matter. I, I truly believe that. Um, and many um, researchers will say the same thing when you talk about safety and security, relationships is the, is the base uh, piece of that. Um, but that also helps kids identify who should be in the building. If you see somebody without a badge, they should be uh, recognizing that to an adult so that uh, there's some clarity around whether or not that person should be there. Um, we are pursuing a safety assessment from an um, outside source. Um, I've had lots of training, um, Lieutenant um, Colonel uh, Grossman, uh, who is uh, one of the, the gurus in, in uh, violence and in, in, uh, school tragedies and whatnot. I've had the opportunity to be trained by him a number of years ago, um, as well as William Haggerty in the uh, Grand Rapids Police Department. So. I've really been fortunate in that respect, and I know some of other members of our team have had some good training as well. But we have a perspective, but these these people have a different perspective. One of the companies that we're looking at, they um, is uh, they have police officers, which is a more of a reactive perspective, and then there there are CI agents are also on their team. So when they do these assessments, they're more of the proactive. So they think about things ahead of time, where the police are thinking about the, the reactive and response pieces. So I think there's gonna be some real value in us doing that. Uh, as, as many uh, um, have recognized, we do have the night locks in the high school. That was a, an item that uh, we felt was imperative to get in um, for our students and for our staff. Um, so we do have those all installed in the high school and we have a plan to get those in place in our um, other facilities as, as the um, 
product comes in, which I think most of them are in, and then the uh, staffing level. So we're really hoping to have those in, you know, by the end of, won't put too much pressure on, but some some of it will be done over our uh, winter break that we're about to have and, and then shortly thereafter. So obviously we went to clear backpacks. Uh, the community response to that has been just uh, nothing short of amazing. Um, the number of donations and things that people put together to help kids uh, have those first day when they came back. Um, you know, we had people there and you could just see how kids, kids came and, and they had that. That's not a cure-all, that's just another strategy in the layer that we utilize to help uh, people feel more comfortable uh, and, and to recognize what uh, belongings um, kids have. And it's important at the high school, we've, we've really empowered kids through technology to utilize technology and, and have uh, different tools as they go to class. So it was important that they still have the ability to transport those types of things. And so the uh, clear backpacks were a solution to you know, try to try to move forward um, with that as well. Um, we do have a no backpack policy at our learning options, um, but their requirements as to what they take into class and, and their travel times and the uh, things that they're doing in class don't really dictate their need for the bags. Um, and then in the middle school, we certainly, um, they have bags, but they went back to their pre-pandemic behavior where those bags um, stay in their lockers. So um, again, every, every solution creates problems and you could look at it from lots of different angles, uh, but those are some things that we um, have utilized uh, as we move forward. Our leadership team has met multiple times. Uh, we basically felt like, I don't know, about seven days straight. Uh, we were meeting at the end of the day just to get a gauge. How's the staff doing? How are you guys doing? What are your immediate needs? Um, and then uh, we met with Lieutenant O'Farrell uh, to debrief about the tragedy and really reflecting on what he knows about our facilities. Um, just a, a great conversation that we had there. And then um, I'm losing track of the days, but this week we met with Wes and our technology team. We have a compiled list from all of our facilities about what their needs are. Um, most of them are around facilities and technology. So we went through item by item by item. Where are we at with this? When's it gonna be done? Um, that needs to be done before we leave work today. You know, those types of things. So we feel really good about the progress that we've made with that. And then tomorrow we're meeting with our um, emergency management team to review all of those pieces. Um, in those big pieces, and again, our uh, conversation with the lieutenant was very helpful about their experiences because they too learned through this whole uh, tragedy about how to how to protect schools um, and and each other uh, as we move forward. So um, it's been a it's been a um, you know long challenging uh, time for uh, for everybody, including students, parents, staff, um, all of us. But we're taking steps moving forward and, and really working to support everybody. So. Just wanted to share that and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Questions for Ben. Very nice report on Ben. It's a lot of ground. It's covering a lot of ground. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. So we'll move ahead to student achievement and uh, Heidi. Yeah, a few things this evening. Um, the past couple weeks, honestly, the um, main focus has been um, being in buildings, um, providing uh, support to staff and students. Um, so that has been, like I said, top priority. Uh, the other thing, it's hard to believe, but we are already um, gearing up for second semester, uh, which will start in January, which as you know, um, also leads us to begin preparing for fall 2022, um, our last board meeting, you approved a handful of new classes. So um, we're easing into that mode of um, scheduling that will be coming out um, for the high school January-ish and then our middle schools uh, February and March. So that's right around the corner. Um, also this week, we are kicking off um, a district-wide uh, book study which I will be sharing more information um, in January. Um, I don't wanna give too much because um, some buildings have not uh, rolled it out yet. They have this week to roll it out, um, but that's going to be, I think, very exciting as well. Um, moving on to uh, the bond world, uh, Blanche Sims uh, has been meeting and they are working on the fun pieces now of the project. Um, looking at picking out carpet, picking out um, colors, uh, tiles, uh, bricks, 
Um, so the decorating, the um, like I said, the fun um, fun phase. So um, we are continuing to make progress there. And then um, our furniture for secondary, uh, we're on weekly meetings now. Uh, so the pilot teachers are working with the designer to really narrow down and um, work out a package for each of the content areas. So that will be coming to you um, probably in the beginning of February. So. All right, questions for Heidi. Go ahead. I have just one brief question, and at our last meeting, there was a gentleman from the neighboring that neighborhood that touches up to the property. Has, I just want to go back and make sure somebody reached out to that group. From oh yeah, we've been in, we've been in contact okay. with all those neighbors. Yep. Thank you. Great. All right. Thank you, Heidi. So move to human resources, Rick. Um, it's not on the agenda, but I did want to share with you. I know. Obviously, through all that we've uh, experienced here, um, considering the tragedy that took place uh, with our neighbors, our focus has been a lot on our students, which it should be. But our staff also uh, really needs to, to be taken into consideration. And I want to share with you, I, I'm not sure that you're aware, but we did institute an employee assistance program two years ago now. This would be our second year. Um, it's available to any staff member, anyone in the household of that staff member, so their spouse, their children, to um, really deal with uh, a lot of different things, uh, counseling services, financial services, all kinds of things. And, and I'm happy to say it's all done um, in a confidential way. So I don't get any information related to who's accessing, accessing it how often they're accessing it, but um, I do get some uh, soft data that tells me if it's being utilized or not. And I can tell you that it has seen a significant increase in utilization here in the last couple of weeks. So we have a service in place for our staff and their immediate families, and it is being utilized to a degree that um, we're happy with. Awesome. Great. And? Our new hire. Our new hire, yeah. yeah. You've, you've met her, so All welcome right. her. Great. Thank you. Move on to finance and Jen. Uh, good evening. On the agenda are a couple of uh, bid awards uh, for uh, approval tonight. Uh, the first one is a technology bid. It's really a two-part procurement process. The first piece is specific to student device acquisition. Um, if you recall, back in June of 2019, we established a preferred vendor process with a three-year purchasing commitment. It was an RFP, RFP process with three <coughs> responses, and we established a C High Computer Products Incorporated as our, as our selected preferred vendor um, under this model. Um, their pricing is based on the, their um, our, um, REMC pricing, which is a cooperative agreement process. Um, so just to, with that as a backdrop, we're moving forward with additional acquisition of student devices, included our 192 laptops, 96 docking stations and monitors, 150 student iPads, and a product called JamF iPad Management System. It is a software system, and uh, just if you're wondering, there's a specific designation for funding coming out of the general fund to pay for that. Um, software in and of itself is not an allowable bond expense. If you buy a new system, including hardware with software on it, that is an allowable expense. This is just this is just basically licensures. So that's why that comes out of comes out of the general fund. Um, so on balance, bond dollars are funding the CI. The technology pieces coming from CI, uh, one hundred ninety three thousand and eighty two dollars. Apple uh, cost and targeted at sixty six thousand six hundred, leaving twenty six hundred dollars and twenty six twenty five uh, for the general fund for the the GMF um, software management process. The, the next part of the part two of the actual technology procurement as, as presented tonight is related to uh, structured cabling process. Um, we did a, back in January, of actually fiscal 21, we went through a similar bid process. We established a, uh, um, a vendor through a selection to provide cabling, structured cabling to the district. In that actual bid, there were established what's known as uh, um, set pricing 
So as we move forward and adding buildings to their schedule, that, which is essentially what we're doing, we're expanding the scope. That pricing was established back in 21 and is being forward and that's what these numbers are based on. So from uh, Stadium Elementary will be added for $66,490, Oakview, $147,184, Scripps at $146,543, Walden at $136,130. Um, we've established a contingency that's just a, a, an allowance set aside in the existing technology budget under our control, not, not connected with the vendors, or the vendor of $99,270. So for, for a recommendation piece, uh, it is our recommendation of the Board of Education authorize the administration to purchase student devices from CI not to exceed $193,082.88. From Apple, not to exceed uh, iPads from Apple, not to exceed $66,600. Um, additional so, uh, management software from JAMF uh, for $2,625. And add additional scope to the existing contract of AMCOM Telecommunications. They're the structured cabling vendor that was selected previously. We want to add uh, those four buildings, I, excuse me, the one, two, three, four buildings plus contingency. Um, so $496,543.88 for the four buildings plus the $99,270 in contingency. So the grand total of the tech procurement here of $858,121.76. More than happy to answer any, any questions. Go ahead, Mark. So John, can you um, remind us from early in the year the buildings that were impacted with the initial contract for the cabling and infrastructure piece? Sure. We uh, basically the bulk of the projects uh, that's been t um, tackled under Series One, as well as some of the other facilities. This building had some cable and work done. I believe they made it over to the Trans as well, but for the most part, the Series One's projects are really the ECC, Carpenter, Orient Oaks, Paint Creek Phase One, Stout Stadium Phase One, um, Weber. Weber definitely had the the uh, structured cable. I'm not sure Paint Creek did yet. There are bigger pieces coming yet. And, and then at this building. And, and so will, will there be any more added into that? Any more buildings? Um, off the top of my head, we may be adding um, at the back end the high school piece. I'm trying to recall if we did that in the uh, two summers ago already on the front end of this product. So there's a potential for an additional um, added scope. Okay. And the other piece that I had a question about was a contingency piece on here where it says it's not provided for the vendor, and I just wondered if you'd help me understand that. Yeah, the point of that is that it's, it's funding that's set aside within our technology district managed budget, meaning if there's, you know, you get into some buildings and you find things you didn't expect, so you need to, you know, make decisions on the spot, pay for it, and the funding's coming from somewhere. This is where it would sure. come from. We don't turn it over to our vendors and let them know that they have, okay. you know, X amount in the contract plus Y amount to spend and contingency. They just uh, have the not to exceed in contract amounts. And if there's issues that go beyond the existing contracted scope, you come back to us and Plant okay. Moran, who's our technology designer. So it still remains on them to be able to come back and say. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And then we get to decide when they suggest, oh, well, if, if when we got back there, our technology people could say, well, that's not an issue. We don't, we don't need to replace that. But, but at least we have the you have board approval to go ahead and spend that money if you right. do notice something that. That's a good point, Jake, in terms of the pre-board approval piece yeah. from a timeline of keeping projects on timeline and that's kind of thing that, that really kind of helps that. And, and if there is an issue between Plant Moran as the tech designer, you know, the, the rewall personnel in terms of looking over the shoulder and our internal tech team, if we decide to make a change or it's a warranted change, then, then we um, fund it, so to speak, through it. So that's a good point. Good. Others? Questions okay. for Jeff? All right. The additional piece on here is related to tents. The district previously acquired some tents. Um, originally, in terms of addressing some challenges or potential challenges associated with the, the COVID issue, um, so we had some outside capacity, things like that. The those tents, the relative, the, the demand for relative to the amount we had, they were gone in a heartbeat. They're being used a little bit differently than originally envisioned. Um, middle the uh, the band groups and what's the other big group that's are really using them, if I remember them right, in terms of the utilization. So we've moved to add more to the inventory, the process that normally goes through that. Um, so, um, in terms of acquiring them, at this front end of it, there's a, in terms of a full disclosure with these tents, 
There's a bit of a variance from past practice based upon um, a less than normal approach that in the ideal world, we'd go out and do a formalized, more of a sealed bid approach. This has got a competitive process tied to it from a quoting process and internal comparison. We ended up in the same vendor that we've used previously, American Tent. We're very satisfied with their experience. But uh, from a full disclosure point two, piece of the, a piece of the issue is timing. Original completion was expected to be 12 weeks out and they got them done much quicker. So, and that all occurred during when we moved some board dates around. So it's on me in terms of handling the scheduling and the timing on that. That could have been done better. Done better. That will happen better than anything going forward. So I apologize in terms of the um, delinquency and coming to the board for the formal uh, authorization piece of the, of the award side. So all that said, um, it is recommendation that the, the board authorize the purchase of the 12 tenths that's uh, at $59,076 and $1,777.77 in shipping and um, all included in terms of the, pro uh, the uh, of procurement. But your action resolves some immediate issues that we, that we. Yeah, yes it did. Thank and you. I do think the, uh, the, fill, the uh, different facilities are going to be very, these tents are 20 by 30. The first wave is 20 by 20. Um, I can see the high school bands group really <laughs> utilizing some of these. And I think some of the uh, middle school will actually good in terms of the additional ones as well. Good. Steve, you had a question? I did. Just for my education and maybe. John, the shipping on this, and I know every company is different, and I'm sure you thought about it too, but did we ask if we can waive the shipping and have them <coughs> absorb that since they're making so much money? That's a lot of shipping. No, it's part, of, it's, it's part of their quotes. All, all the vendors that we talked to have a quoted piece tied to it. It's not negotiable? I mean, okay. Well, everything's negotiable. Um, but they're also really heavy. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're, you'd be amazed at... Well, I'm sure they have their own trucks. Do we know is it delivered by their trucks? Yeah, no, they deliver them. So they deliver them to site. It's shipping to uh, offsite point here at no, I understand Operation that. Uh, maybe you misheard me. I'll take off the mask for a little bit. Do they have their own trucking companies, John? Do they own trucks, or are they paying the Teamsters to bring it over? Uh, to be honest with you, I'm not sure who has ownership of the vehicles that delivered the the tent. My point for raising that is if they. If American Tent has 20 trucks and they're going to Pennsylvania through Michigan, they're making money off the ship, and that's all. It's just a gimmick sometimes that companies use, just for my point of view. Okay, appreciate it. So they can tag shipping, and then they pocket another four grand, for example, if, and then they make a stop to Orion, make a stop in Detroit, and they're making good money off of that. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm just talking out. No, I understand. I appreciate it. But we don't know. No. All right. Thanks. Thank yep. you. Okay. John, Thank how you many? I have one more. Question. How many tents did we purchase previously that we already own in the district? Six. Six, and then this will bring us up to eighteen total. Correct. Okay. Twelve of them. Of, these are bigger. These size are the bigger too. size. And you've said some people have. I guess what's the vision for the tents other than the marching band, <laughs> obviously? Or, oh, I mean. Like, kind of what's the scope of the tent, like, other than Yeah, using they it. were actually, classes were going out them, got, going out and using them every day. The problem came in where when we first put them up, uh, band and choir <laughs> claimed them, <laughs> um, so which made sense, obviously, during yeah, the times. Are, but mm -hmm. it is, it really does allow um, teachers to go ahead and take their classrooms outside. Mm -hmm. um, you know, more frequently. So th we were a little bit surprised, not a little bit, we were very surprised at how <laughs> how quickly they were claimed and being used. Are the majority of these at the middle school and high schools? Do we have any at the elementaries or are they all kind of slated for middle school, high school? The majority. It's my, it's my understanding yeah. is deployed at the middles and the high schools. Okay. Yeah. The majority yeah. at the middle it's schools, not, you know, three of them. Yep. Yeah, right. they're, they're accessible, they're accessible. And regardless yeah. of okay. where they're stored. So they can be moved yeah. for yes. yeah. various. Absolutely. But definitely yeah. middle and high school. I mean, that was, the tent was the band's classroom. Yeah. If you I'm recall, they, 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 had to, they had to be 12 feet apart <laughs> right. uh, back when we initially did it to avoid quarantining and, and all right. of that. But uh, yeah, provides opportunities moving forward for sure. So Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Other questions? 
I just want to make a comment and give our B and G guys kudos with this because they're the guys that are going to put the... it up and take it down and put and store mm -hmm. it and care for these things. These are huge. They were, mm -hmm. Yeah, they're getting quite good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Treat them well. <laughs> they're going to be mad at me too for you know. Oh yeah. <laughs> John's yeah, going to want to do a July board meeting outside. I got a feeling. <laughs> do it under the tent. That's a good idea. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. John, uh, uh, anything to add? I, all set. All right. Thank you. So we'll uh, go to the Finance Committee report. And this is uh, uh, a follow up to the report that we we would have had at the last meeting. And Jake? Oh, geez. Um, I was just looking at our minutes to say. They're not, so we must have agreed. Approved them last time. Yeah, approved those last time. So I've, I, I, honestly, I don't have that report up in front of me. Um, okay, well, Jen, could you just fill in uh, from which our one finance meeting? Yeah, the, the, the big pieces we talked about was um, an overview as the thought behind the process of uh, the timing of the budget amendment for normally we target <coughs> November, December, and we're pushing it out to February, mainly because of the uh, outstanding questions and uh, associated with a lot of the federal funding. Um, the other piece was an update on our shared time services program that's that's moving forward. And there was one other one. We talked a little bit about the property, the cell tower. Yes, the property. There's a um, Verizon is looking to or has requested to place a cell phone tower on our Clarkston property. So that's a potential hanging up there. There's nothing gone forward even from the point we were talking about it yet. If that becomes a realistic thing, it'll come to the board in terms of conversation and then action. That was my recollection. Yeah, yeah and the shared services was really interesting that, that Rick mentioned it when he was talking, but it's a, over 100 student add to this, to services that we're providing. Maybe you could probably give a little better feedback, but that brings in several hundred thousand dollars mm -hmm. in funding to the district. So. Yeah, it's gonna, it, this year will net it roughly I we'll say 350,000 after costs. Next year we're expecting the, we've got about 160 kids, <coughs> FTE kids, share time this year. We're expecting that to, to double basically next year. Um, some of that will be driven by current law and any changes going forward in terms of their caps associated with the programs. John, how close to a cap are we on that right now? We're about 50% there. Okay. The formula involves uh, current year and prior year um, Overall student or overall student counts in any district. So in our case, we did benefit from the change in formula from two years ago. Normally, it's a 90-10 weighting. When you know, getting back to Rick's program about um, the difference between headcount and FTEs, and which we're funded on, is that formula. So this year, when we do the math again, it'll probably slip down to where you, we'll probably cap out around 320, somewhere in that neighborhood. Great. All right, we good? Yes, Thank sir. you. All right, so we'll move to action items. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move that we approve the following consent agenda items. Approve payment of the November bills in the amount of $7,942,110.91. Approve minutes from the December 1st, 2021 regular meeting and also approve the Head Start coordinator's report. Thank you, is there support? Support. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. The consent agenda is approved. We have a motion to approve the certified new hire. I move to approve a certified new hire as presented. Thank you. Is there support? Support. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. A certified new hire is uh, approved and welcome to Leanne. We have a motion to authorize the bid award for technology. I move to authorize administration to purchase monitors, laptops, and docking stations from CHI and iPads from Apple, totaling $262,307.88, and approve a change order to the existing Amcom Telecommunications Incorporated contract in the amount of $496,543.88. Plus ninety nine thousand two hundred seventy dollars contingency from bond funds totaling eight hundred fifty eight thousand one hundred twenty one dollars and seventy six cents, as presented. Thank you. Is there support? Support. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Aye. Thank you. The 
bid award for technology has, is authorized. May I have a motion to authorize a bid award for tents? I move to authorize administration to purchase 12 tents, totaling $59,076.93, which includes shipping of $1,777.77 as presented. Thank you. Is there support? Support? Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Thank you. The bid award for tents is authorized. Uh, we'll move on to public participation for other non-action items and topics. And we have two people who signed in this evening. And we'll begin with uh, Nick Ladney. Do you want is me that to correct? Give, you want me to give the ground rules? Yes. Yeah. Before, before you begin, uh, Mr. Ladney, would you uh, uh, go ahead? Yes. So, welcome to the Lake Orion Community School District Board of Education meeting. This meeting is a meeting of the board for the purpose of conducting school district business and is not to be considered a public community meeting. If you desire to address the board, you have to sign the public participation sheet located on the table at the meeting room and entrance and indicate your topic before the meeting commences. Uh, when addressing the board, please identify yourself by name and indicate if you represent a group. The individual's time is limited to five minutes. Individuals addressing the board should take into consideration the rules of common courtesy. The public participation porting, portion of the meeting cannot be used to make personal attacks against a school board member or school district employee, which are totally unrelated to the manner in which the member or employee performs his or her duties. If the con comments had constituted a complaint against an employee, the employee must have been notified in advance and has the right to request a closed meeting. Uh, the board is not obligated to answer questions or make comments in response to issues raised. In general, such issues will be referred to the superintendent. With your five minute time limit, I will give you a 30 second indication, 10 seconds, and then at the end, we would ask you to. Thank you. Thank you, my name is Nick Ladney and um, I technically live in Clarkston, but I am in the Lake Orion School District, uh, 4660 Mesa Court, uh, just off of Indian Wood where it's a dirt road. Um, what brings me in tonight is the tragic events that happened just north of us. Uh, that was a near miss. And I've been thinking about this since really the Marjorie Stone and Douglas incident and what can be positively done to do it. I've heard a lot of complaints, a lot of hand wringing over the years and it just keeps going on. I've prepared something I'd like to just hand to Julie so she can hand out to each of you. Um, let me give you some facts. In the four and a half years before 1973, there were 130 airplane hijackings, about one every two weeks. Since January 5th, 1973, when metal detectors were put, installed, there have been Thank four you. in 48 years that involve guns. None in the past 20. Nationwide, there have been 23 school shootings so far this year. 89 since 2018. I don't, transparent backpacks are certainly a help. They're not the answer, okay. Um, my son's a senior at Lake Orion High School, and it was looked at pretty, uh, it was considered a joke, okay? It's wintertime, a kid can carry a gun in the back, of, in the small of his back very easily. He could wrap it up and put it inside that backpack. I saw what my son brought, okay? Yes, it's a help, but right now, a student can do that, and what about visitors? As I've outlined in there, I've been to the high school, I've been to middle schools, I've been to the elementary schools, many times. And they essentially have a ring doorbell. I've never been asked to open my jacket, fan my jacket, or hold up an ID. I simply say, I'm there to see somebody. They let me in. It's too late at that point. Um, Walk-through metal detectors are used in about 10% of the high schools in the nation right now urban high schools primarily because of their high crime rate. They're legal, they're safe, and they're affordable. $360,000 could equip all of our schools, all 10 schools with 20 metal detectors. 
and I lay out the details in that thing. And again, my numbers are nowhere close to, is it Mr. Arnett? In terms of the amount of thing, but it, you know, the number of students and everything, but it's not gonna really affect the analysis. Um, that's about, and that would equip it with a walkthrough metal detector, as well as the package scanner, just like you have in the airport. And these things are, are very sophisticated these days. That's $50 a student. I'll write that check right now, okay? Um, how much did it cost to redo the high school stadium? I've had a lot more than $360,000. What's more important? The chance of a shooting in a Lake Orion high school in any one year is about one in 400. 25 shootings a year, 100,000 schools, do the math. During the 13 years a child is in a Lake Orion school, there is a one in 30 chance that there will be a shooting somewhere in a Lake Orion school. Maybe not their school, but somewhere. A one in 30 chance. And about a one in 300 chance the shooting will be in his or her school. The odds of a mass shooting, about one in 770. Those are great odds if you're playing the roulette wheel or, or gambling in Vegas or something. But when you're gambling with your child's life, those aren't very good odds. School districts are gonna start being held liable, okay, for this. We, you may have heard Jeff Figer's going after Oxford for $100 million, and he's not even representing somebody that is, was injured or killed, okay? There's a legal way to prevent these shootings in Lake Orion schools. It's proven to work. I ask that the board consider that. Thank you. Thank you. Next individual, uh, Kirsten Barber, please. My name is Kirsten Barber. I'm a Lake Orion resident, mother to five. Those are terrifying statistics and ones that I'm not comfortable with. My first question to the board is, what are the state requirements for safety drills? How many have to be done? I know there's a fire drill. I know there's a tornado drill. There's the active shooter drills. How many does the state require? And how many beyond that minimum does Lake Orion do every year? Because I ask my kids, what happens if there's an, you know, an active shooter? Do you guys know what to do? What's that code called? They have no idea. My middle schoolers have no idea. That's terrifying to me that they don't know what to do in that situation. So if someone could please get that information to me, I would really appreciate it. Now, 24 days ago on November 22nd, I was in that room next door and met with Heidi Mercer and Ben Kirby. This meeting was to discuss the difficulties my children are still enduring while in school because of the mask mandate. But a major focus of mine was trying to relay the importance of mental health and the fact that you cannot have good physical health without good mental health. This district has been so focused on the physical health aspect of this pandemic and in my opinion, sidelining the mental health aspect. Now, I don't expect, nor do I really want, the district to monitor the mental health of my children as none of you sitting up here and as far as I know, are mental health professionals. However, since my children spend more waking hours in your care than in my own, I do expect you to not cause mental anguish and harm to my children. As I've stated before, the passive aggressive comments made to my children, labeling them as insubordinate and dismissing their valid concerns is very um, concerning to me and causing my children mental harm under your watch by your employees. Um, just last week, the, the Surgeon General came out and stated that the mental health aspect of this pandemic is staggering and we need to quit ignoring that because we are so focused on the COVID pandemic, we are ignoring this and you cannot do that. And it would be tragic to focus on one aspect of this pandemic and cause another one. So please, if you haven't seen that article or heard that information, look it up, it's very easy to find. Now, during this meeting with Heidi and Mr. Kirby, I requested an option for my child to speak with a trusted teacher on days that they were struggling with the mask compliance. 
I was told that this accommodation would be disruptive to the school environment. Thankfully, it was brought to the principal and teacher's um, request and they did agree to that. Um, but the attitude from the senior members of this district is that, that a simple request was disruptive. My child's mental health on a day is disruptive. Not something that should be considered, but it's disruptive. Now, a mere eight days later after this meeting, the horrific message came from my child. There's apparently a shooter at Oxford Heights School and we're in lockdown. My heart broke at that moment and honestly it hasn't recovered and I don't know that it ever will. Eight days after bringing up my concerns and pleadings to focus more on what these mandates and policies are doing mentally to our children, our neighboring community was forever changed by a mentally troubled child. We know there were warning signs and I cannot help but wonder had this happened here in our district in one of our buildings, would those warning signs have been dealt with any differently than Oxford? I'm publicly calling on all of you to please, please, Consider the mental health consequences your policies, mandates, and rules may have on our children. My daughter came home last Friday and asked me how keeping backpacks and lockers would keep her safe. When should a child bring a gun to school, they would have a greater chance of hurting more students in a body-filled locker pod. I didn't have a logical answer, so I brought her up here to pose that question to the administration. The response was it makes some students feel safe. And my daughter's response to that person was, it makes me feel less safe. Her feelings were dismissed. And that is heartbreaking as a parent to know your child does not feel safe at school. Our students are not blind. They are not naive. They're calling out your illogical policies and you choose to dismiss it. Please listen to the parents and the students. We want our children to be safe. We entrust them to you on a nearly daily basis. Please help us keep them safe but not by instilling policies that really don't do anything to keep them healthy and safe. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that concludes uh, public participation. And we'll move on to recap and next steps, Ben. I uh, captured one item and that would be that you guys need to complete the board officer questionnaire and get it to Julie uh, so that she can get that compiled. But other than that, I didn't pick up on any other items. Okay. Thank you. John, closing comments, please. Nothing further. All right, thank you. Rick? Uh, nothing further. Thank you. Heidi? Nothing further. Just wanted to mention uh, next month I will be at the uh, MASA Midwinter Conference uh, that is uh, annually held in January. Uh, this year is in Grand Rapids. It goes back and forth between Grand Rapids and Detroit. Um, you did a nice job on your social contract today. Again, we didn't have a, a ton of conversation, but I think you guys are doing a great job of following uh, what your commitments were there. And just wanted to you know, say thanks to uh, all of our first responders and our staff and, and whatnot, um, and our students and parents. It's just, it's been you know, some continual tough times and, and people continue to endure and we really um, appreciate that and wish everybody a safe and uh, restful holiday season. Thanks. Thank you, Ben. Steve. Please. I hope everybody had a nice Hanukkah and I wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a happy and very safe New Year. Thank you. Thank you. Susan? <laughs> Just uh, thanks to Rick for the detailed 10 minute presentation. Um, actually, all joking aside, I, that's a really great uh, basis for, I don't think we should have finished it in 10 minutes because that drives so much in our district, our numbers, and it's very important. So it's great to know you guys are looking at that weekly and that level of detail. And um, I appreciate all the information that you shared tonight. So thank you very much and uh, happy holidays to everyone. Thank you, Susan. Danielle? Um, it, it may be a bit of a throwback, but a few, more than a few weeks ago now, um, a few of us were able to attend the lovely production of She Kills Monsters at the high school. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge the theater program and what an amazing um, show they put on. It, it really was a treat to be there. Um, and as always, I just want to acknowledge our staff and thank them for their t always their tireless work, but you know, keeping 
our kids safe and, and always being there for them. I can't tell you how many, you know, messages my son got from everybody and it, it, his teachers. And one of them was, I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. And <laughs> it was amazing. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank and you. And happy holidays. <laughs> thank you. Jake. Uh, I'd like to welcome Leanne, our, our new hire. And just to the, the whole community, um, we know how we know how difficult this is. All of our hearts and in, in, in our minds are still with Oxford that um, and always should be. But I, I've just seen how hard exact that our, our staff is working and how much you know the students want to be back. It's so many students want to be back. They, they want the sense of normalcy and how hard everybody has worked to get that for them, it, but it's a process. It's going to take time, and there is no perfect solution if anybody's looking for it, but we're doing a lot of little things to make better, and that's how a lot of progress gets done, and I really do appreciate how our administration and, and all of our employees are doing the little things that, will add, that, are, that are adding up to make a big difference. So thank you to everybody. Thank you, Jake. Scott. I'm going to give it a try. <clears throat> give me a sec. Okay. I have been a Lake Orion Dragon for over 47 years. <clears throat> In that time, one of our biggest rivals has always been Oxford. Not because of a dislike, but because we are so close geographically that Wildcats and Dragons bowled together, went to church together, and hung out together. Oftentimes, depending on which side you live on, Lake Orion is referred to as Oxford South and Oxford as Orion North. There's always been that closeness and community with a great spirit of competition and fun. Sadness, anger, questions, and fear have surrounded us all for the past two weeks, and I am sure it will resonate in our minds forever. My family and I have chosen support, prayers, love, and honor. We will continue to support all students, teachers, faculty, board members, parents, and community members in any way possible. We will continue to pray for healing of the deep physical and emotional wounds suffered by many. We will continue to love the Wildcat Nation and lift them up in any way humanly possible. I thought of something when I was in the shower, so I had to add a page. We will honor the heroism of young people running at grave danger. We will honor those young people that lost their lives. We will honor the teachers and staff that truly saved lives that day. We will honor the students that help one another get out, and we will honor the first responders for doing all that they do. Thank you for listening, and go Wildcats. Thank you, Scott. Very nice, Scott. I want to start by thanking our administration. I know that the tragedy that hit, um, hit like we're in two. And I know that you guys worked your tails off for hours on end, so days that you didn't have to be there. Um, thank you. I had the privilege of standing in line waiting to attend Matilda and to get up to the front and find out it was sold out. But somebody behind me said, my dad is supposed to be here, but he's not. You can have his ticket. So I added money for it and I got to sit through it. And I watched an amazing performance by middle schoolers who were grieving and scared and had a rough time. And an art teacher who had the wherewithal to stick with the job and support her students through it. And it was amazing. And I know that's repeated in our district throughout, that while our team grieves, they continue to love and support one another. This week has been a week of concerts as we try to pick up and amidst our pain and grief, try to carry on with the season and support each other. There's still an opportunity tomorrow night to support the high school and their winter concert. If you are so inclined, I encourage you to go take a breath and enjoy some music that our students are producing for the holiday season. There are no words to express as the continuation of grief goes on. Um, I attended Oxford's board meeting last night just in support and they were very grateful for the cards, you all. 
Um, it is in our darkest days when courageous leadership shines through and your leadership and Oxford's leadership is gonna shine a light on the path for, to lead our communities and our school districts through this. We will get through this. We're gonna be Oxford strong together. And um, I will always remember the impression of the gal with the dragon um, embracing the wildcat. So with that, I say good night. Thank you. And I wish peace to all members of all of our communities. Uh, on that, we are adjourned. Good night. Thank you.